Master Music Show. It's the Murder Master Music Show. Chris. It's the Murder Master Music Show. Man, Jay. It's the Murder Master Music Show. 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 Hip hop is dead, but we don't resurrect it. You follow what mainstream says, but here it gets rejected. If you wearing tight jeans, don't expect to get respected. I'm from a time where wearing black was always on your checklist. From a time where faggots get checked if they reckless. From a time where if you got too much shine, we snatch your necklace. This real shit here, Illuminati, fuck the industry. We represent the street and they respect our street ministries. Hate no shorts and cut the middleman, literally. This hip hop savior, our birth scenes like this. This is a place where no one sells out for relevability And the masses can get a chance to explore more creativity You gotta be kidding me If you call that hip-hop Niggas with high stage and fluorescent flip-flop We kill a big brother Cause we know he watch You don't like what I'm doing Then you can suck mine Oh, and you don't It's the Murder Master Music Show It's the Murder Master Music Show It's the Murder Master Music Show it's the Murder Master Music Show. 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 Episode 200. 99, man. We're one away from 399. How the hell did we get here? I don't even know. Um, Next week, uh, Thursday, before we get into this show, next Thursday, the 15th, episode 300. Um, I don't even know who's going to call in, but I anticipate, uh, who knows? (laughs) Just call in and find out. You know what I'm saying? Tune in, UGSforlife.com. Tonight, we have a special guest. He's actually a return guest. He was just on a couple of weeks ago promoting his then upcoming book, Original Gangsters. Well, it's still upcoming because it drops technically on the 13th, but you can pre-order it uh, right now. I suggest you do that because this is one hell of a read. Before we bring him on, I want to get your thoughts on the book, Mac. What did you think of it? Man, so far, I'm loving it. Uh because as I'm reading, it's an easy read. Like I was telling you earlier, it ain't it ain't like a book where somebody just wrote and it's, uh, you know, a whole bunch of words and it ain't getting to the points and nothing. No, he go right off into it. And got so far, each section off, it's just it's just it's flowing smooth. And it's, it sound original, man. <laughs> the original game. Yeah. And, and, and to give you an idea, uh, folks, you go in the back, there's an index from A to Z. He doesn't just have the main players from the West Coast uh, and East Coast. He has all their affiliates. I mean, everybody you could think of, anybody and everybody who was in the business, whether it be uh, attorneys, bodyguards, uh, road managers, I mean, you name it, it's in this book, Original Gangsters. you got to get that mm-hmm. ASAP. I'm going to bring out Ben Westhoff right now. Ben, welcome back to the show, brother. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you guys for having me again. I really appreciate it. Well, we, oh, yeah. we appreciate you coming back on the show. Um, and uh, I tell you what, the book, uh, like we were just saying, it's a phenomenal book. People need to get it. Um, I have a few questions that I want to ask you that uh, we didn't touch on last time. But um, I think you got something you want to ask them first, Mac, don't you? To the Pretty much, Jerry uh, Heller. yeah, yeah. Uh, rest in peace, to Jerry Heller for one. You know what I'm saying. And condolences to his family and everything. But when when I got to the, I think the name of the chapter was something in Calabasas. And uh, what was it when Jerry? What Jerry wouldn't let you actually interview him? He just wanted. To, he well, just wanted to talk to you, thing. basically. Yeah. Well, I begged him to try to interview him for months and he kept putting me off and finally I said, Well, I'd like to see Easy E's house. Easy E's old house in Calabasas. So he said, Cool and he gave my name to the guard at the private living community 
And mm-hmm. I came up there. He showed me these house. He showed me Dr. Dre's old house, which is just like two blocks away. And then he invited me into his house, which is just two doors up from Easy's. And, you know, then we started talking and, and it was cool and, you know, it, everything was great. But then I asked if I could turn on my recorder to have a real interview. And he was like, I'm not giving you shit. He got really, yeah. he got really <laughs> upset. And I said, you know, what's the deal? And he said, this, this guy who wrote this other book about West Coast hip hop had kind of screwed him over, he said, and, you know, but, you know, and he had all these like loud barking dogs that I thought were going to bite my arm off or something, but eventually he, he relaxed and he agreed to do the interview and he talked about all sorts of stuff dating back to the accusations against him from Ice Cube and Dr. Dre and kind of the, the battle he was in with Easy's widow, Tamika, for a long time. And so I ended up liking him, even though he was kind of a prick to me at the same time. Yeah, I know. Jerry, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's very funny how he put it. No, uh-uh, you ain't getting shit. Um, but uh, eventually, you know, you, you got him to open up a bit. Uh, and you just brought up Tamika, um, you know, she's uh, uh, obviously there's just stuff about her in the book. Um, we'll get to her in a minute. My question that I have first is uh, probably one of the most interesting things that I found in this book because, as a fan of Easy E, um, I love the dude's music. We had Crazy D on the show. He played a snippet of a song from the '80s that was unreleased, and we was just our mind was like, "Wow!" Our minds were blown. In your book, after Easy had passed, uh, it states that he had two uh, suitcases full of tapes um, that were stolen. The FBI recovered those, but nobody knows where they are. Could you talk about that? Because there might be a shitload of unreleased Easy E music out there. Yeah, it was a really crazy situation when Easy was in the hospital and then when he died, basically the the state of California enlisted this like third party company to manage Ruthless until his estate could get sorted out in court. So basically there was Tamika's interest and then there was this other guy named Ernie Singleton who was hired to take it on take on Ruthless. But meanwhile, someone like changed the answering machine at Ruthless and they said, if you've reached this number, you should call this number in Canada. And so meanwhile, in Canada, someone else had this office and they were claiming to be the real Ruthless. And this person ended up, whoever it is, we still don't know who it is, but they ended up with with a briefcase of these unreleased EVE music and they were up there and they were, they were basically threatened by the FBI and said, you have to have to turn this over. But as I I was looking at these FBI files and there's all these parts that are redacted out. So it's not clear to me whatever happened to this music, but yeah, like you said, it really could still be out there. Yeah, can you can y'all hear me? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. My bad. Uh, these were actual. Uh, I what I was trying to them. say. These were actual FBI files. So, um, does I mean does the FBI have these in possession to this day? I don't think they do. To tell you the truth, there's just a it's just a big mystery because all the the parts of the FBI file that would have told me that information were crossed out. So I, I couldn't get the whole story, unfortunately. It's, it's a mystery. Wow. I bet you I bet you it is. I bet you it is. I bet you it is because, you know what I'm saying, whenever they cross out documents, they're, they're, they're hiding something, obviously. In this case, it might be unreleased EDE music, people. I suggest everybody hit up the FBI headquarters and demand to release these EDE songs. <laughs> Hit the motherfuckers up. 
why not? They sent Ruthless a letter, didn't they? Y'all could send them a letter. Um, but they, it just goes to show you that, uh, you know what I'm saying, if, if, if those tracks are out there, who knows, you know, what uh, you know what era they were from. They might have gone all the way back to the 80s. Maybe some of those songs that Crazy D played for us are in there, too. So, yeah, that's huge, folks. Possibly unreleased Easy E music is out there. Um, now, in regards to Tamika, uh, what I found real strange, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, Nation of Islam supposedly administering the drug Kemron. Um, but here's another thing. Uh, they made the marriage license private, you know, which is it's kind of strange. From, from my understanding, most marriage licenses are public. Um, and also, no autopsy. What, what, what do you gather from all that? Well, it's hard to know. I do know that a lot of people were suspicious about all this, particularly Tracy Jernigan, who is the mother of one of Easy's children named E.B. And she, in particular, was really upset that there was no autopsy, that this marriage license is private, so no one can see it, and that a lot of people, including the mothers of a lot of Easy's children and the children themselves, weren't allowed up to Easy's hotel room, or excuse me, to his hospital room when he was on his deathbed. So it raises a lot of questions in a lot of people's minds about what exactly was happening during his last few weeks. Another person I talked to was Sharice Henry, who is the EZE's assistant, and mm-hmm. she was not very. She was very suspicious of stuff that was going on in this time too. Like she saw Easy was revising his will one day, and she thought that was a bad idea. He had a new lawyer who was who was taken on by Tamika and and Cerise didn't think that he should be revising his will at this stage when he was so sick. And, you know, ultimately Tamika got control of Ruthless, which was valued at $30 million at the time. And Mm -hmm. she, she took control of his estate. And some people think this was, this was a bad idea because he he hadn't really been easy wasn't a one woman guy as we all know and he wasn't one who had talked to very many people about getting married but the other side of the story is that Tamika had been working at Motown Records she did have a background in the music industry and so it's quite possible that he thought she more than anyone else he'd been with had the qualifications to run Ruthless. So that might have been part of it. Wow. Yeah, definitely. That's, cr- that's crazy definitely. that they wouldn't even really let his family up in that shit like that. That's, you know, I couldn't imagine that. Wow. Yeah, shit. I mean, how, how are you going to do that? You know what I'm saying? Um, it's just one person. I mean, how could one person have that much control? That goes to show you, folks, you better know the law. Because if you're in a situation, you know what I'm saying, like this, the uh, same thing could possibly happen. Now, as kids, they were so young, you know, there was nothing they could do. Um, but now that they're older, you would think that there should be something they could do. Um but I, you know, I, I don't know the the, the, the law and the well, there was a big, extra limitations there was a big and all that. Challenge. Yeah, there was a big court challenge after he died, and there were a lot of lawsuits flying around between Jerry Heller, who thought that he had a, a legitimate stake in Ruthless, and he sued Tamika, and then Tamika sued him for misappropriating money, and they finally settled years later but as far as the as far as who was going to be in control of Ruthless Mike Klein 
claim also alleged that Easy was in no condition to sign over the company to Tamika and that he, it wasn't what he would have wanted to do in a sound mind. But ultimately, the courts ruled with Tamika that she legitimately was entitled to the company. So that kind of stopped any further legal action. Yeah, that's, you know, I mean, that's weird. You would think that, uh, I mean, similar situations that happened with other people that have passed. I remember James Brown was in the morgue for like a month because of, uh, uh, you know, problems going on with the family and stuff. But uh, this situation, to me, this is this is what I gather from uh, interviewing people as well, as well as information from your book. Everything happened so quickly. You know, the man, and we, we spoke about it last time, but the man goes from HIV positive to full-blown AIDS. Okay, then, then uh, he, he, cha- he, he, you know, he, he changes his will, he gets married, and then he dies all, very sudden. And then he's cremated or, or whatever. I, no, no, he's buried. But I mean, there's no autopsy. There's no autopsy. Sorry, I was confusing uh, the Hebrew with uh, Tupac. But you know, it makes you wonder why wasn't there an autopsy? You know, uh, the, it just doesn't make sense. But then again, those are questions that only seems like only one person knows. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. That's for sure. It most definitely is. <clears throat> you know, uh, because and, easy and and was, Jerry, I, I think when they had just got Jerry bone, Heller. they was right back on their way, too. So. Yeah, Jerry Heller actually, uh, leading into, you were talking about the lawsuits, Jerry Heller actually had a lawsuit going against Tamika, um, and I believe didn't they settle? Yeah, they settled, and they had a non-disparagement clause which meant that they weren't allowed to talk badly about each other in the media and so I think that was part of the basis for Jerry's lawsuit against the makers of Straight Outta Compton because Tamika was one of the producers on the film and he thought it made him look bad in that and therefore it was a violation of of that non-disparagement clause yeah, because he had won that lawsuit, that previous lawsuit, um, and yeah, yeah, that it would definitely make sense. We spoke with um, Gary Ballin yesterday, uh, Jerry's cousin, um, and uh, he does believe his health was affected by Straight Outta Compton. Uh, you interviewed a lot of people, just as we have. You've talked to uh, so many people that knew Jerry, that knew Easy. Do you think Jerry was the type of guy that they're trying to portray? Because, I mean, a lot of people I've talked to said he was a straight-up nice guy, and he was always always real nice to us. What is your Yeah, well, on, I mean, that? you know, from my experience, as I described earlier in the show, I wouldn't say he was super nice to me. But um, yeah. I will say that, you know, he could be abrasive, and, and, you know, that was, I guess, part of his charm. But I, I will say I wrote a piece for Forbes this week, and it's kind of an excerpt from my book, Original Gangsters, but it's also a standalone piece that asks the question, did Jerry Heller actually steal from NWA? And I know most NWA fans assume that he did because of Ice Cube's allegations and then Dr. Dre's allegations. But I really went through all the records and and first of all neither Ice Cube nor Dr. Dre ever sued Jerry Heller and so you'd think that if he really stole from them that they would have filed a lawsuit you know another thing to consider is that it wasn't Jerry ultimately who made the financial decisions it was easy easy on the label and so while I'm sure Jerry had a, a ton of influence. At the end of the day, it was up to Easy. So it was yeah, he was know, the decision maker. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so through all my reporting and my research, and you know, digging through files and talking to people, I haven't found any evidence that Jerry Heller actually stole from anyone in Easy from anyone in NWA. So. You know, I, I just don't think it's necessarily right that 
people assume he did. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a great point. It's a great point. Um, I want to move along to uh, Tupac. Um, Tupac, as we know, 20th uh, anniversary of his passing is coming up. A lot of things are coinciding, it seems. Jerry was uh, uh, laid to rest on Easy E's birthday, 52nd birthday, which would be um, here coming up, uh, you know, to the anniversary of Tupac's passing. Um, I want to talk, though, about the, the shooting at uh, Quad Studios in New York. Um, in your book, you go into uh, great detail about um, everything with, according to interviews and whatnot, people that were there. Um, it says uh, that when he was uh, he was shot, uh, Officer, uh, I believe Greg Kading, he believed that Tupac, uh, we, you know, there was always a notion that he, you know he got shot in the scrotum, the chest, I believe in the head, a few other spots. He believes that he shot himself. Um, yeah, yeah. That was he, one of the uh, things. What's the deal with that? Do you think that that's what happened, or? Well. I haven't personally seen the forensic evidence, but but Detective Greg Kading has seen the forensic evidence, and I trust Kading, and that was his conclusion, was that, A, he thinks Tupac, probably the gun went off accidentally, and he shot himself, and that Tupac had some, had some lacerations on his head, and Kading thinks that was from being pistol whipped and Kading's general conclusion was that yeah if these guys had wanted to kill him they could have killed him but they didn't and later the the guys who were found to be in the party have, have basically said they intended it to be a warning and so you know that it all it all basically adds up to me what what Greg, Greg Kading said yeah, and what, what, what is uh, crazy about the situation, he played dead in the elevator until uh, until the uh, the people who shot him left, and then he went straight up to where uh, Biggie and uh, Puffy were, and uh, I believe uh, Little C's was uh, uh, in the room as well, covered in blood, and he had thought that they, it seemed like they were mad at him. You know, maybe they were surprised or whatever to see him there. Um, I'm wondering why he would go back up to them. Did, at that point, did he think they had something to do with it, or did he did he come to that conclusion later? No, I don't think he had come to that conclusion yet. I think he went up there basically because he was hurt and he needed help. He needed and help. Yeah. Yeah, and he, I think he still thought they were friends at this point. In fact, Biggie came to visit him at the hospital, and Tupac's dad chopped it up with Biggie. And to this day, Tupac's dad still thinks Biggie is innocent and Biggie didn't know about it beforehand or anything like that. And it wasn't until later, when Tupac was in prison, that he started hearing all these rumors from people he trusted that Biggie knew about it in advance. So that's when he started getting paranoid, and that's when he told Suge Knight that he wanted to go to war against Death Row, or excuse me, against Bad Boy. You know, personally, I, I tend to think that it may be possible that Biggie knew about it in, in advance. He, he well might not have, but even if he did... I don't know if there's anything he could have necessarily done about it without risking, you know, uh, violence against his own self. So I, I think it's I think it's still an open question, but I think it's quite possible that Tupac really overreacted and kind of jumped to conclusions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, that, I mean, that was just interesting, you know. Um, the whole thing, and, and you know, he eventually uh, blamed Haitian Jack. Um, but uh, yeah, he. Uh, I'll tell you what, this movie, All Eyes on Me, is getting ready to come out. Um, straight out of Compton, did extremely well in the box office. 
A lot of people loved it. A lot of people thought there was a lot of inaccuracies in it. Um, from the people you've spoken to, uh, what has been their take on the movie so far? Have you heard any uh, information about like it, it, how authentic it's going to be? And is it going to be better oh, straight out of Compton? Yeah, I don't know very much about it at all. It's it's kind of been slow for information to leak out, so I have no idea what to expect. Yeah, it definitely it, it definitely could be uh, could be a, a great movie. I mean, the guy looks enough like Tupac to where he could pull it off. I just hope uh, you know certain people ain't left out and and different things of that nature. Um, but no, the original Gangsters, um, like I was saying before, hell of a book. You cover so many different eras. You talk about, uh, you know, Ice T, the cop killer record. Um, tell everybody about that for people that don't know, because we live in an age right now where a lot of violence is being perpetrated by the police. Um, and Cop Killer was like one of those fuck the police type records to the extreme. I mean, it went, it went a step above fuck the police. Um, do you care to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, Ice-T had this heavy metal side group called Body Count, and they made this song Cop Killer, and then they put it out and basically nothing happened. But then it was about six months later, or a few months later, and Ice-T was, I think he was at home playing techno, Tecmo Bowl, he said, when he heard that the vice president, Dan Quayle, was talking about him on TV, and he turned on the TV, and basically Dan Quayle was going off on how this was uh, such a horrible thing that shouldn't be tolerated by his record label. And then there was basically a media feeding frenzy and Charlton Heston, this was before he was president of the NRA, he gave this big speech at the Time Warner stockholders meeting and Time Warner was the label that owned IT's label. And they started getting bomb threats. Wow. IT and, and his uh, roommates. And so basically, you know, they started uh, holding boycotts of amusement parks that were owned by Time Warner. And so the whole thing just get a, just started spiraling out of control. And I see that his own, like, daughter was pulled out of middle school, I believe, and asked all these questions about if her dad had ties to terrorist organizations or something like that. Wow. So, Things just got way too hot, and finally Ice-T agreed to pull the song off the record, and he just started giving it away for free at his concert. Yeah, he actually had no choice at the time. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. he had to do it. Right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people accused him of kind of caving in, but I think if we found ourselves in that situation with our children being involved with, with bomb threats, with people's safety, with uh, all these boycotts and stuff, it would be pretty hard to imagine, you know, uh, standing your ground. And what's crazy about it now is uh, everything I see do on TV is fucking, he a cop. <laughs> How ironic is that shit? But what, yeah, what was like sure. your inspiration for really writing this book and uh, getting all the information together? Because this book is very informative. So, like for people that that's a little younger and don't really know the story, I, I would recommend this type. Th these are the type of books that they need to read because it's like it's coming from the actual people's mouths. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I guess the inspiration was this was the music that we listened to in high school. And so I grew up in Minnesota and, you know, obviously thousands of miles away from Los Angeles, but it still felt like LA and South Central and Compton were such a big part of our world 
because there were movies like Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society, and then the music, NWA. When Straight Outta Compton came out, I was still pretty young, but when The Chronic came out, I was in high school, and that was huge for us. And then when Doggy Style came out in 1993, yeah. that was like the biggest thing ever. Like hey, yeah, I remember them crazy. days like it was yesterday, man. I think I was like in the ninth or the tenth grade when, when Doggy Style came out. <clears throat> and I think yeah. it was in the winter time too when, when we was really pumping it. And I remember yeah. cold days walking with my with my Sony Walkman playing the shit out of uh, some Doggy Style. <laughs> yeah, so. You know, they say the music that you like in high school, it'll be the music you like the rest of your life. And, you know, it, it, but it's not just the music, it's the stories of these guys. And while all this was happening was such a tumultuous, tumultuous time in Los Angeles with the, the rise of crack cocaine and then the Crips and the Blood and all the escalating murder rate. And then you had the the Rodney King beating and the L.A. riots and all this stuff really informed the music. So as a journalist, it was appealing to me, too, to explore these stories as well as a fan of the music. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And see, that that's why, like, you summed it, it, it pretty much sums it up as I, as I read this book why it's so well written because I, I feel the same way like we li- we this is the shit that we grew up off of and I still listen to all of the stuff I, I listened to back then more than any of the new stuff oh yeah best era in, in rap by far I mean don't get me wrong there's, I mean there's some cats in the underground making dope stuff today but oh yeah uh, when it, when it comes I mean you, you gotta think about it Spice One on a major label you know, Pooh Man mm-hmm. on a major label. All these guys, those were the mainstream artists of rap back then. Now the mainstream right. artists of rap are, I don't even know Mom- what they're saying. I can't <laughs> relate to these Mostly dudes. the mumble man, yeah. And, uh, I've become I know y'all the seen they got this show fuck. called, uh, <laughs> uh, what is it, uh, Facing Suge Knight on Tuesday night, some documentary about, about Suge. So, uh, uh, how, how tense was the beefs and stuff with Suge back in the day when Death Row was at their power? Was was it really as intense as everybody thinks it is? Yeah. Or was it more like the media just hyping shit up a lot of times? No, I mean, if anything, there's probably a lot of crazy stuff that happened that we still don't even know about. But I actually, in, in my book, in Original Gangsters, um, I tell the story that Crazy D had an encounter with Suge Knight, and it happened at the Anaheim Theater, the Anaheim Celebrity Theater, and Crazy D just, he didn't know who Suge was. Suge basically was, uh, came on as DOC's bodyguard, and he mm-hmm. was just a quiet guy who had, wasn't known at all in the music industry, and Crazy D, who was, an early NWA member came up and was just basically saying hi to DOC and Suge Knight was like, what are you saying to him? And Crazy D was like, I, you know, I wasn't saying anything. And they got into an argument and then basically Suge punched him through a door, basically. He, I guess he went flying and Crazy D said his teeth shifted. It was like the hardest punch he'd ever received and wow. you know that was that was basically just the beginning and so once Suge consolidated his power he had kind of three weapons at his disposal and one was brute force if he needed it he was he was a huge guy for one and he had this crew around him of guys that were huge too and then he also had influence because Death Row was so popular that, and had so much money coming in that so many people were looking to Death Row for, for jobs or for, you know, for, for help in, in the industry and things like that. And then he also was kind of got in with certain aspects of law enforcement. 
there was uh, an assistant DA, I believe, named Lawrence Longo, who was disbarred because he rented Shug his, his house in Malibu, I think it was, for $19,000 a month. And Suge gave his daughter a record contract. So, and and not only that, Suge had all these cops on his security. They were like cops from L.A. or Compton who were moonlighting. So they basically had had a lot of power and didn't always use it in the very moral or ethical way. Wow, so Shug was yeah, he uh, was punched him through a door. Crazy D, that's crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> um, shout out to the homie Crazy D too. Um, now you said Crazy D of NWA. I'm glad you said that because um, just like Arabian Prince, a lot of people don't recognize the earlier dudes in NWA. Yeah, we've had the Ghetto Boys on the show, and uh, we, we've had uh, Raheem, we've had Jukebox, DJ Ready Red. A lot of times they're not recognized. Um, shouldn't they be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, too? Because think about it. Cube was on uh, with, with NWA for one record. You know what I'm saying? Um, but so was Arabian Prince. Arabian Prince should have yeah. been in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, too. Why do you think guys like Crazy D and, and, and uh, Arabian Prince and, and maybe Ron Davis and other guys don't get talked about as much? Well, but don't even get guys, acknowledged, I should say. Yeah. Well, those guys, a lot of them were on the NWA and the Posse album. And I actually think that album is really underrated. You know, yeah. it has the cover where the guys are in the alley and some of them are wearing clocks kind of like public enemy and they've got like 40 some of them and that that album was not authorized by nwa it was it was put out by mccola records their first label once nwa started getting famous so i think and the group members kind of dissed it like mc ren said that, that it was a whack album so i think for that reason mm-hmm. some don't take it seriously, but it's got it's got the first recordings from DOC in a group called the Feel a Fresh Crew, and some of those are amazing songs, and it, it's got all sorts of early NWA gems like Eight Ball and and Dope Man with Crazy D, and so so. But even when it came to Straight Outta Compton, Arabian Prince was a major contributor to that album. He's on the cover, which a lot of people know, but a lot of people don't know that he actually helped produce and write a number of the songs. And the reason is is that he he didn't get credit. His name was basically left off a lot of that stuff. He he says anyway, and I believe him because you can you can hear him, you can hear his influence on on certain songs that he's not even given credit for. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, most definitely. Again, shout out to the homie Crazy D. Um, the original Gangsters goes on sale the 13th here in just a few days. Um, if I was to buy this book, let's say I was to buy this book, what is one story in here that you think would persuade me to want to buy this book? If you could pick one, because <laughs> there's tons of them. Well... This is just a random story that I think is funny. It's about EVE's girlfriend, who I mentioned earlier, whose name is Tracy Jernigan, and she's the mother of one of his daughters, Evie. And so, as I also said earlier, Evie was not a one-woman guy by any stretch of the, the imagination. He was known to get two people pregnant even at the same time. But... Tracy was really loyal to him and first, you know, but they still had their fights and at one point they were on the out and this was kind of at the height of tensions between Ruthless and Suge Knight's death row. And Tracy also knew Suge Knight. They were just platonic friends. But she when she and Easy were on the outs, she started spending more time with Suge. And she was actually an aspiring rapper, 
at the time. And her career never really went anywhere, but Suge Knight announced at the Death Row Christmas party one year that that Death Row was giving Tracy Jernigan a record deal as a as a rapper. And so when when Easy found out about this, he was just incredibly pissed off. You know, this was the, the mother of one of his children who was now going to be rapping for his arch rival's label. And so it was basically in, in a case where Suge was trying to get under Easy's skin and he would basically do anything to, to try to annoy Easy. Oh, well, that's underhanded, <laughs> to say the least. Um, you know, like you said, they're trying to get under of, his skin. It, it reminds me of something 50 Cent was doing with, like, Rick Ross when they were having their wars. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's uh, antagonistic. Um, I should not, he seems to pretty much uh, not give a fuck. I mean, he dangled people off of buildings and, and uh, you know, he had those tactics, those strong arm tactics, um, and ultimately, look where he's at right now. Um, we interviewed uh, Big Nads last night, and um, prior to that, he was on the show about a month ago, and um, we were speaking about an uh, incident where Eminem and, and Snoop and Dre and everybody was. Uh, in Hawaii, and and Suge came up there with 50 henchmen. Uh, what what do you know about that? Did you ever hear that all story? Because Snoop told it too, I believe. I, yeah, all I know about that story is from what I heard on your show, but I I will say it has the ring of truth. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. But Suge seems, uh, you know, I I mean. The guy is, you know, he's in jail. He's facing these murder charges. Um, I mean, we all seen the video and whatnot. And here you got NWA. They have this major, massive movie. Um, they uh, they're inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Jerry Heller passes. You know, all these di- all these different things that are happening. But then you go back twenty uh, to twenty three years. Easy still alive. Tupac's alive. All the potential was there for great things. You could have had an NWA reunion. You could have had, um, you know, so many different things that could have happened. Like we were talking about Tupac um, possibly could have signed to Ruthless Records. Um, That would have been an amazing thing. Would it have been as big as uh, All Eyes on Me over at Death Row? We don't know. We don't know. Because you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony, East 1999, that was, you know, that was a huge album, a huge album. What about Easy E being broke? Um, a lot of people, I, I read in there that uh, I think uh, I think it was BG Knockout said that Easy showed him paperwork where uh, uh, money was missing or whatever, uh, um, and then other people have said that he was in debt. But how, how can he be when he he just had a multi platinum act, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony? He just did double platinum himself. Um, from your findings and your interviews, was Easy uh, broke at the time of his death, or or, or was he uh, still still in it to win it, so to speak? Yeah, no, he he definitely wasn't broke. That was definitely something they got really wrong in the movie where they show him having to downsize houses and stuff like that. In real life, he still had his Calabasas mansion. He had places that he was renting in Topanga. He had a house in Woodland Hills and Norwalk and other places too, I'm pretty sure. So no, there, there was no reason to think he was broke like like you said bone thugs and harmony was one of the top selling groups of that era he had he had his own comeback album in 1993 it's on dr Dre killer and there's 
I, I don't know why they portrayed that in the movie the way they did. Maybe it was to try to, for the plot arc or something, but it definitely wasn't true. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. What about um, the split from Death Row uh, for Dr. Dre? Uh, here he is. He's at the height of his career, and he walks away from everything. Uh, obviously, which turned out to be a good thing for him in the long run. But at the time, I mean, that that's really thrown the dice. Um, what, what what kind of information do you have about that? Well, this is a case where Jerry Heller may not have stolen from Dr. Dre, but he definitely, he and Easy did not give Dr. Dre the contract that he deserved. Dr. Dre said he was earning two points as a producer, so that that refers to the amount of royalties he's going to get. And two points out of 100, or or whatever, I'm not exactly sure how it breaks down, but I do know that two points is not a lot. And when you consider the fact that Dre was behind platinum or gold albums from NWA, EVE, DOC, JJ Fad, Michelle, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars that was coming into Ruthless. And Dr. Dre was only seeing a tiny, tiny percentage of that. So even if he wasn't cheated, I definitely think he had reason to be upset. Uh, you could say that it's partly his own fault because by his own admission, Dr. J didn't like to do the paperwork necessary. He didn't really understand or care to understand the business of the music business. And so you could say that it's partly his own fault that he has these bad contracts. But just from the perspective of Ruthless itself, you want to kind of preserve your, your star player. You want to make him happy. And so as Doug Young, NWA's promoter, was saying to me that, yeah, they they should have just torn up the old contract and said, you know, Dre, we're going to we're gonna make you happy. We're going to give you more money. And then if they had done that, I don't think he would have let Suge Knight come in and take him away to start Death Row. Yeah, yeah. But him walking away from Death Row... All the, um, you know, they, they they just dropped all those successful records, All Eyes on Me, Chronic, Doggy Style, Dog Food, Murder Was the Case, Above the Rim. Um, and he just says, you know what, you can have it all, I'm done. I'm, uh, I mean, that's the huge, a, a very huge gamble right there. Because what if the you know, aftermath didn't pan out? What if you didn't find a Slim Shady? You know what I mean? His career could have ended up in a much different place. Um, was Dr. Dre scared of Suge Knight, do you think? Well, I think if he had any sense, he probably was. You know, at the time, it probably did. I mean, it was a huge risk. And I know some people have kind of taken pot shots at Dre or, or wondered why he would do that. But he believed in his own talent and... Ultimately, in the long term, it was a brilliant decision to to pull away from Suge Knight at any cost because now he had uh, an ally in Jimmy Iovine. And Jimmy Iovine not only understood the music game, but he understood how to be a mogul and how to really advance their careers in the record industry and he wasn't tied with all the street stuff. So I think that it was the partnership with Jimmy Iovine that really gave Dre the confidence to leave, to leave Suge Knight, to leave death row. And ultimately, you know, considering his headphones company beats was sold to Apple for $3 billion, the the headphones company that he and Jimmy Iovine started, You have to say that he really took the long game. He played the long game, and he he won. Yeah. 
he uh, he definitely, I mean, the, the gamble did pay off in the end, obviously. But at that time, he had to have been thinking, you know, what the fuck? You know, I, I got to get out of here. It, obviously, something must have shook him enough to say, you know what, you could have the rights to all this. I don't even care. I'm gone. Something must have shook him. But, you know, in the long run, it paid off. Um, again, book drops everywhere. Uh, on the 13th, if they want to pre-order it, then uh, where could they uh, do so right now? Well, the best thing to do is go to Amazon, and if you just if you just do a search for original gangsters and Eve or Dr. Dre, it should pop up. And you can also search my name; it's Ben Westoff, and that's W E S T H O F F. But basically, yeah, if you if you pre-order it now, you'll get it by next week. So it's just about to drop, and it's I think it's like eight dollars off on Amazon right now. Yeah. And it's a good ass book. I recommend it. You know, and you motherfuckers need to be reading books anyway. If you're gonna read one, you might as well read this one, especially if you went to even for. Uh, people that don't even listen to the music as much as we do anymore. It can take you back to a, a place and a time and you actually getting good information. Shit the movies don't show you. You got a lot of it right in, in this book. And I well, appreciate thank you, you for yeah, writing it. The, I mean, you know, to their credit, I thought Straight Outta Compton was better than I thought it would be. But even at two hours and 40 minutes or whatever it is, it's just not enough time to really get everything in there. And there were some very glaring exceptions, you know, some uh, some things that were missing from the movie. You mentioned Arabian Prince. And then there were all sort of the women of Ruthless and the women of these guys' lives who basically were barely mentioned, if at all, like Michelle A and J.J. Fad were really big parts of, launching Ruthless in the beginning and you know Michelle A was involved with Dr. Dre and Suge Knight and has a kid with both of them and it's, and she had said that Dre beat her and there's just a lot of intrigue that they didn't even get into at all right that's crazy yeah, too that, that's, that's, I'm about to say that's a movie all in itself I'll be willing to see a death row movie, too. Yeah, there is a Michelle A. biopic is coming out on one of the cable channels. I, I forget which one. I think it's yeah, Lifetime. I, she yeah, got, one, she got one of those cool. Lifetime movies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 she got a Lifetime movie. Um, but, yeah, she, she was uh, definitely, you know, uh, in situations where, her life was in danger. Um, I mean, she, uh, Suge Knight, uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. But her story needs to be told as well. And, uh, and, but, but, you know, we talked a lot about Pac and a lot about, you know, Easy e but I mean, you got people in here like Cocaine, uh, you even talk a little bit about Everlast, um, uh, of course, Chuck D, Public Enemy. I mean, a lot of East Coast guys, too, you mentioned. Capone and Noriega. Uh, nah, it's Mob Deep. You're real thorough about the whole the whole project, and uh, I really think cats need to check out this book because, I mean, it, it goes way beyond the, the history of uh, the West Coast. It goes all over uh, hip-hop. A lot of great stories are told in this book. I recommend everybody goes out and picks it up immediately, pre-orders it, do what you can. What about book signings and tours, Ben? Are you going to be hitting the road? Yeah. I got one coming up in Long Beach on Wednesday. I have a reading at the Barnes & Noble in Long Beach on Wednesday, and then I'm going to be in Atlanta on Monday the 19th, so uh, a week from Sorry, I'm I'm having trouble doing the math, but it's it's Monday the 19th, and then in St. Louis on Tuesday the 20th, and would love for people to come out. I'll do a reading. I'll do a reading, and then in Atlanta, Rhythm D 
is going to be there and we're going to talk. He's the producer of Real Compton City G's and he was basically Ruthless's, Ruthless, Ruthless's in-house producer who stepped in after Dre left and you guys know all about him. I'm sure he's legendary. He he was a he was a, a death row defector, wasn't he? He was on the show telling us that he had left death row. That that's a great story. Can you talk about that before we go? Yeah, that it is interesting because he was there while the chronic was being recorded, and he was like, "This is the hot sound. This is going to take over." And then when he came to Ruthless, Easy was basically in a funk. This was after his album 5150 came out and that didn't do very well and the sound wasn't really of the moment. And so Rhythm basically convinced Easy that they needed to get on the G-Funk bandwagon and that he should really go after Dr. Dre. And so from that, you get the song Real Compton City G's and that whole album, which reinvigorated Easy's whole career basically yeah yeah it, it, it was crazy how you know the movie made easy look almost like a victim he had him in tears crying when he saw the billboard and this this and that but in actuality he was getting paid off that album he had people from that camp that came over to his camp you know saying uh I mean, you got to think about it. Here's a guy who, who, you know, was over at Death Row, probably, probably made some tracks, producing, then he comes over to Easy and produces the disc records, you know, which those records were were not weak at all. I mean, they, they went right at the jugular. Easy didn't back down. Easy definitely went uh, straight at him. You know, but uh, everybody get this book, I'm telling you. Original Gangsters, it goes on sale the 13th. Um, Again, Ben, um, before we go, uh, you got a website or uh, anything you want to give, any information about the book, feel free. Let them know. Yeah, you can visit my website. It's benwestoff.com, B-E-N-W-E-S-T-H-O-F-F.com. And you can hit me on Twitter, Ben underscore Westoff. But, but yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for having me on. I mean, you guys are really holding it down. Uh, you guys are really covering this scene better than just about anyone. So I really want to commend you guys on that and, uh, and thank, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. That, Thanks, means, man. that means a lot, man. Real talk. Um, you take care of yourself. All right. Take care. That's Ben West off. Everybody. The book is original gangsters the 13th but you can pre-order it um i'm telling you it's a hell of a read it's a hell of a read and you're talking you know uh over 400 pages um just a uh phenomenal book so much information uh like i said it's got an index at the uh, at the back from a to z uh i don't even know how many pages that is of all the people that's that's uh in this book it's amazing you know what I'm saying? It's amazing. Right. You go from above the law, and here i got to go back some pages, because like I said, there's a lot of motherfuckers in here. You go from above the law all the way to... Shit. I can't even get the damn page. Above the law to uh, young Latanya. Um, whoever that is. <laughs> but, uh... No, no, I'm sorry. You above the law, all the way to yo yo, right? All the way to yo yo. So I mean, you, and you got all these people in between. So many great stories, like uh, Crazy D <laughs> punched through a door. Uh, all right. Uh, Shit night. That's uh, that's uh, that's something that I never heard before. It's that's interesting. Um, a lot of good stuff in there. A lot of good stuff. So everybody, make sure you go out and get that book. Other than that, we will see you guys uh, next Thursday, episode 300. And tomorrow, you and uh, Vel got uh, Underground Saturday nights, 9 p.m. Central. Yes, indeed. Check uh, us out. Yeah, we'll see you guys real soon. UGSforlife.com. We're out of here.